Good morning. I want to welcome everybody to the adult Sunday school class, particularly we are working on a maturity discipleship class, and we're glad that you're here today. Would you take your hymn books, and let's turn to page number 230, page 230, Heavenly Sunlight. And I tell you, we've been blessed with such lately, and we praise the Lord for that. Let's all stand if you're able. Page 230, on the first, walking in sunlight all of my journey. Thank you, Sister Molly. Wonderful. You may be seated. Let's have at this time our ushers come forward and we'll take up an offering. We are glad to have you in Sunday school today. <clears throat> Look forward to not just the Sunday school, but <clears throat> the teaching hour uh, coming up, the preaching hour tonight. Services at 630. We're looking forward to what the Lord has provided and we thank him for that. Hope that you've had a a good week, and we got a good week, God willing, coming up, if it be the Lord's will. Every day is accounted for a wonderful purpose, and we ought to rejoice and be glad in that. All right, good to see Brother Bill. Good to see Brother Kevin. Let's pray and ask for God's blessings upon the whole Sunday School Department and our teaching here. Thank you, Father, for the day that you have blessed us with. Thank you for your grace, your goodness, your love, your mercy. Thank you that we can walk in heavenly sunlight. I know what the author is referring to, and it's... It's a wonderful blessing, and I pray now that you'll bless the teaching of your word throughout the church, bless the offering it's taken up, both the gift and the giver, and bless the lesson here now. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, then you may move forward. Matthew chapter number 19 this morning. Matthew chapter number 19. Last week we studied and did a teaching on the letter C, which deals with living a crucified life. This is the type of life, according to Galatians chapter 2, verse number 20, that Paul the Apostle said he, he strove to live, and he did, and we're thankful for that illustration of his life and the copy of the Word of God that teaches us such. Now, today we're going to be dealing with the letter D, which deals with the subject of divorce. Now, let me just say this. This is always a touchy subject. Uh, there's no intentions of hurting anyone. There's no intentions of underlining anybody because sometimes in the Baptist churches when this is brought up, people get really, really, really skittish because of the word divorce. But nevertheless, it's a teaching. and I want to try to help you with this lesson. Matthew chapter number 19. 
There's, there's probably two subjects in the Word of God that always get people a little bit on edge. One of them would be this particular subject, and the other one is when you start talking about money. And uh, both of them are wonderful in the sense of uh, having Bible doctrine to define, in the sense of truth and teaching and the ability to be taught. Both of them are wonderful subjects for that particular uh, sphere and avenue to be on. So Matthew chapter number 19, starting at verse number three. Matthew chapter 19, verse three. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him. So, so right off the bat, we know that they're, they're trying to find fault with him some way, shape, or form. Their, their coming to Christ is not purely legitimate in the scope of trying to be educated or edified. And saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, now this is probably the most important thing the Lord says, have ye not read? That's probably one of the most important things we find here in this context that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this cause, now we are going back to Genesis chapter number two, which we'll look at in just a moment, and said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God had joined together, let no man put asunder. Now they replied back from their question of verse 7, and they say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? Jesus responds again to their second question of verse 8. Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her which is put away, committeth adultery. His disciples, now they jump into this discussion, and they say unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. Jesus responds to his disciples, but he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it let him receive it. Now, let us go to the book of Genesis because this principle starts there in chapter number two. And let's just take a look at what the Pharisees are saying and uh, what the Lord is in reference to when he says, have you not read? The word divorce means separate. The word means separate. And in the book of Genesis, chapter Number two, we'll find here in verse number 18 of Genesis chapter two. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Now, back to Matthew nineteen twelve, he talks about three types or three spheres of being a eunuch and that would be those that are born that way from their mother's womb those that are made that way of other men um, for instance if a king went in and he conquered a neighboring count city he may take all the men and make them eunuchs so they cannot go into his particular women that are in the city and pollute what he may think is the proper gene. So they would be forced to do that. The Assyrians was very cruel in forcing their captives to um, become eunuchs. And then he says there are some, and I think the last and the tail end of this is more in a spiritual sense, in the sense of being dedicated to Christ. And there are some that be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake, for the work of God. That is being solo, having no other cares but that which is of the Lord. 
He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. So going back to man, or excuse me, uh, Genesis chapter 2, and the Lord said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And we see that God formed out of the ground every beast in verse 19 of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam and gave them a name. And whatever Adam called them, I'm just going through this in verse 19, that was the name thereof. And verse 20 says, but toward the tail end of the verse, for Adam there was not found and help meet for him. Now here's the marriage thought that they are talking about in Matthew 19, the marriage principle. And the Lord caused the deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam awakes, obviously, out of his sleep in verse 23 and says this, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now here's the principle that Jesus mentions in Matthew chapter 19. This is the scripture that was in reference. Therefore, verse 24, shall a man leave his father and his mother and they shall, excuse me, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now, the question in verse number three is answered really in verse number four with this thought. Have ye not read? You're asking me a question that the Bible would give you a good, clear answer on. And so he is going back, where is the Lord getting his authority at for this answer? He is first of all telling the Pharisees that ask him this, that he is going to not give a personal answer, but yet he does, but he is going to work off of a biblical principle and precept that they know, and he's going to build on that biblical principle and precept, by the way, which was given by Moses, by Moses. Now, I want to say something in the Sermon on the Mount, because this subject is really barely, this subject is, is barely, um, not looked at in the full scope of it. it. It never really is. That's why there's so many different ideas about this. Um, when Jesus came onto the scene, and, and I say after his baptism, and he started preaching the word of God, the one thing he said before he got into his Sermon on the Mount was this. In, in Matthew 5, 17, after he is, is telling them, blessed are they, uh, the, the, the merciful, blessed are the poor, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are they which are persecuted. After he had done all that, then he talks about their a light and they ought to let their light so shine. Here's what he says. Think not that I am come to destroy the law. Now we understand the law primarily to be the Ten Commandments. But the word of God in itself is referred to as the law of God. But particularly, the Ten Commandments would be in view here, but yet the Word of God. Watch. Why is the Word of God more involved so with this as well? Not just the law. Think not that I am come to destroy the law, and then he says, or the prophets. So this would be the law and the Holy Scripture and the Holy Writings of God that he revealed through his prophets. I have not come to destroy what? The law. I've not come to destroy the prophets, but to fulfill. Verse 18, for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth shall pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Now we do know that Christ fulfilled the law. And the reason we know that he fulfilled the law is because on the third day, he resurrected and being resurrected, he conquered death, hell, and the grave, which the law gave the sentence of. But Christ couldn't be given that sentence because he fulfilled the law of God perfectly. But not only did he fulfill the law of God perfectly, he fulfilled the words of the prophets perfectly. Now, he doesn't tell you what prophet it is, but I can tell you this, one of the greatest prophets is Moses. That's not arguable. That's not arguable. One of the greatest prophets in the Bible is the prophet Moses. 
And there was others, no doubt. We would say minor and major. Not that they're, they're less significant or more significant. It's not what that means, minor or major. It just means some wrote two or three chapters. Some wrote 60 chapters. Some had a lot more to say than others. They were major. They wrote a lot. They, their writings are hard to figure out. You've got to really study. Where some, you can read rather quickly and understand readily, easily uh, to understand. So... I want us to understand that Jesus' Sermon on the Mount um, is, is referring here in the thought of Matthew chapter 5 that Jesus had not come to destroy the law. That word destroy there means to, de- to demolish by annihilation. That's exactly what the word means. It means to make desolate. So Jesus says, I've not come to make the law desolate. He's come to fulfill. We know that. Keep that in mind. He also says, I've come to not destroy, but to fulfill. Now, the word fulfill means accomplishing. Now, I want to look at chapter 19 because this is a real good context to look at when we think of this. Okay, the very first thing we do see in verses number 3 through 6, and once again, this goes back to Genesis chapter number 2, dealing with the institution of of marriage. And that is this. Marriage is to be a lifetime commitment. All right. So he, the question is asked about putting her away for every cause. Have you not read? God made them. Now, by the way, male and female. And for this cause shall man leave his father and his mother and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh. There are no more twain, there are no more two people, but one. And then he says, what God had joined together, let no man put asunder. And I want to stop right there. And I want us to just see this context that teaches that marriage is a lifetime commitment. Now watch, it is a male, it is a male by birth and a female by birth coming together, two individuals as one. Marriage is not biblically a man and a man. Marriage is not biblically a female and a female. Marriage is not biblically a human being marrying an animal. Human beings do have affairs with animals. That's talked about in the book of Romans. It's, it's, it's beyond my mind of thinking, but simplicity here is male and female there's two becoming one okay and then he says here that that oneness verse six what God had joined together let no man put asunder again the word divorce means separate and we see here that that oneness is not to be divided or put asunder now the word um, divided means or asunder It means a divided state, a divided state. Okay, that's what the word means. So we understand that marriage is a commitment to God and his word. That's first and foremost, God and his word. Because God made the man, God made the female, God brought them together. They were two for one purpose. So marriage, first and foremost, is a commitment to God and his word and his calling. Okay, understand that. It's a commitment to God, his holy word. Have you not read? Now, why does he mention this? This happens. And and we're people, we're all prone to weaknesses. We all have weaknesses. But many times in our relationships, as a husband and a wife, it just happens. We do not refer back to, have you not read? We refer back to how I feel. How I feel. I feel this way. And I, I, by the way, I'm a person of feeling. I know what that's like. I do know what that's like. And sometimes we see in the news people who can't handle this type of stuff. This is a very serious thing. I mean, sometimes we see separation and the feelings of an individual are brought out. How are they brought out? Well, they, they, they take their life. So this is not an easy thing to deal with at all. In any way, shape, or form, we should never take someone lightly who's going through something like this because this is something that we need to help people with. And by the way, this does happen, and we're going to see this in a moment. 
But just in the first sense of the word, marriage is a lifetime commitment to God, his word, and his calling. And I say his calling. God, there's no doubt, watch. He, he let, led the animals to Adam. Adam named them. He put a sleep on Adam and took a rib and he woke him. And there's no doubt there was some sort of calling here. I don't have the full details, but there was a calling of these two together. And Adam accepted that calling and he says, I'm not ashamed of you. And he made a public declaration. So there was a calling there. From time to time, I'm, uh, you know, life isn't easy. And sometimes I got to remind myself or remind my wife, this is a calling we have. This is more than a union. This is a calling. This is more than, than um, um, uh, what you think or what I think. This is a calling. And, 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 and it's not easy sometimes. Because I'm going to say this, not to, to harm women at all. Because that's I love all of our women in the church. But women are a lot more sensitive than men. And their feelings are hurt a lot more easier than us. And that's how we're created. And, you know, and i got to be careful with that. And, and I think you, if you've been married or in a relationship with a person any amount of time, you know you can hurt their feelings pretty easy. And then when the feelings are hurt, emotions start to arise. And when emotions arise, not all the time, but most of the time, the Word of God is not sought after. It's emotion or the reflection of how I feel. And that can be, that can be very, very bad. We want to keep in mind that can, be, that, that can be bad. So we want to avoid that. It's a commitment to one another. One another. Well, how is it a commitment one to another? Well, I said it's to God, his word, and his calling. But it's a commitment to a different watch. And whether we fully embrace this or not in understanding, I can't tell you everything that God does with the genius of the brain, of how he makes a woman and how he makes a man to think different, talk different, be different. But I know he puts their differences together to be one. And what I'm getting at is it's a commitment to one another. My wife needs me. I need my wife. There's a commitment I need to be to her and a commitment she needs to be to me. And that commitment I fully don't quite understand. And by the way, this is why it is very important because sometimes it happens. Sometimes we, you know, that's why we want to tell our young people, date for quite a while, court for quite a while, seek the pastor's counsel, Seek the will of God. Seek things out there. Now, this is just for a young couple getting ready to get married. No children, no nothing. And we tell them, let's counsel you. Feel this thing out. You know, make sure this is what you want. Give it time. Because it's very easy for all of us to get our emotions a little bit mixed up and to, and to, and to, and to step into a relationship with the wrong person. Ladies and gentlemen, it happens all the time. It's common in the world. I just watched a documentary, not that I watch documentaries that much, but it was a documentary of a, of a man, they said, most evil thing in the world, and it was a documentary of a truck driver who had a good family and got divorced from his wife and, and, and separated from his children and went on a, a killing spree. And you know what he would do? He would go to places where there was a lot of truckers at, where he would find vulnerable people who were skipping town or going from state to state. and. They would invite themselves into him. He would not go looking for them. They would invite themselves into him, and he would take advantage of them in a bad way. And he got caught eventually. I mean, he did some very, very bad things. And here this individual, not thinking, is thinking this man's going to make some sort of commitment to me. Well, he was going to make a commitment, but not right. And once they got in there, they started begging probably for their life. And some of those victims did do that. He scratched things into the back of his cab of his truck. They were fooled. And I'm just saying we got to be careful about our emotions. And it's a commitment one to another. And let me just say this. If, if, if this is involved, which sometimes it's not, but sometimes it is. If there's children, it's a commitment to children. It's a commitment to children. Because a child has the right to know what a mother is and a father is. That's their God-given right. So it's a commitment to children so that they can understand a home. Now, what God hath put together, we see here, marriage is of God. It's of God. Now, I've been with my wife for a long time, but she's not the only lady I've ever dated. And I don't recall ever telling another lady, I'm going to marry you. 
But I very well could have. I mean, the woman at the well had, you know, several husbands. Her intentions were right. Her intentions were not wrong. Her intentions were right. But the condition, the condition was not sought after properly and thus there was failure. So I want you to see that what God hath put together, marriage is of God. Watch. It is God ordained and it is God purposed. I want you to hear a couple things here. Just give me your ear. We'll quote a couple verses. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 says, marriage is honorable in all. I want to say something. Marriage is honorable. We're living in a day and age today. Watch. You don't really need to get married. You don't really need to get married. There's all kinds of filth. Why do you want to be tied down? You can, ha- you can have an affair. You can be physical and intimate. You don't need to be tied down with all that. Get what you need and check out. That's, that's wrong. That's wrong. Matter of fact, from the word of God, no relationship should be physical with a man and woman until they are married. Now, sometimes we learn this a little later in life, and that's okay. That's, that's all right. Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs chapter 18. Verse number 22 says, and I'm going to just quote a couple thoughts here. Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. I'm going to quote to you Proverbs chapter 19. Listen to verse 14. Houses and riches are the inheritance of fathers. And a prudent wife is from the Lord. A prudent wife is from the Lord. It's a good thing. Uh, First Corinthians, Paul says in chapter 7, let me just make mention here of verse number 2. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. So we understand here that that marriage is honorable. It's from the Lord. It's a blessing. And there's a relationship. There's a relationship. Now, number one, marriage is a lifetime commitment. Now, number two, I'm going to have to ask the question that is asked. In Matthew chapter 19. So number two, the question, and I'm going to put it in this scope, why did Moses command for divorce? Because that's the question they ask in verse 7. They say unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? Now, reading this, there is just all kinds of of ideas that come up. And I don't want to get too involved in ideas because this is, this is something that we want to be as correct as possible about. Watch, and we know that the Bible is inspired by God. They say unto him, why did Moses then command? What's the word command mean here? You know what it means here? It means it's a governing factor. It's, it's something that governs. God is to govern a marriage, but there is something else in it too. The word can't, I mean, we just can't get away from the word. The word means, the word command means to order or to direct. There's an order or a direction. For what though? For what? Well, it's not mentioned here. But we've got to go back and look at Deuteronomy 24. And we'll go to Deuteronomy chapter 24. Why, they asked Jesus the question, why did Moses command or order or direct for divorce, separation. Well, a question that would arise, did Moses do that? Well, he did do that. Did Moses do that? Sure he did. Um, Chapter 24, I want you to listen to this. Now, I want to say this again. Jesus has not come to destroy the law or the prophets. 
got to keep that in mind. There are some that would think that one piece of scripture has been completely of none effect because of another piece of scripture. And that can't be. That can't be because not one word of the Lord falls to the ground and what he says goes forth and it accomplishes its purposes. But this is something that the nation of Israel was given. Here's what God told the nation of Israel, a people of God. Deuteronomy chapter 24. When a man had taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes because he had found some uncleanness in her. Now let me stop. What is the uncleanness? Who knows? It, it don't have to be prescribed. He doesn't mention what the uncleanness is. The Pharisees had their view on this and another group of religious people had their group on uh, their thought on this. But it, biblically it's not, it doesn't tell us. Here with Moses that is. Then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. It's what it is. In, in the book of Deuteronomy. Now, verse 2. And when she is departed, so here, looking at this, is a man permitted to divorce? Yes. He's permitted to divorce according to Deuteronomy chapter 24. Let me go on. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and marry, or excuse me, she, go, she may go and be another man's wife. Is she allowed to remarry? Yes. Is that what it says? Now watch. Is all scripture given by inspiration of God or not? Now watch. There's more instruction. And if the latter husband, so she's got a bill of divorcement, she's left and married another man. And if the latter husband hate her, it doesn't tell us why. It's just his decision of whatever that reason was. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. And if the latter husband hate her and write her a bill of divorcement and giveth it in her hand and sendeth her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife. So she was not allowed to be remarried back to her first wife. She was able to be sent out. She was able to remarry. But if that man died whom she remarried or they got a bill of divorcement, she was not allowed to go back and marry her first husband. Done. But why? We're not going to get too much involved in this. This is where the problems come at with this particular doctrine. I don't know all the details about this as far as her uncleanness or why God says she can't remarry her former. I don't understand all of that. I don't need to. God says, trust me. Now, I, and I'm going to try to do that to the best of my ability. I'm going to go on to verse number um, four. Her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife. After that, she is defiled. For that is abomination before the Lord. Thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. So when we look at this, the question of the scribes and Pharisees is very legitimate. Now they're tempting him. And there could be reasons of why they're bringing this up by other things he had done in his ministry. But he clearly teaches that if a man hath an issue with a woman, or he finds some uncleanness in her, and, and I, I know how the Pharisees interpreted this. According to their writings, it was adultery. According to the Sadducees, it didn't matter what it was. She's not a good housekeeper. She's lazy. It didn't matter. It, and they fought, they, they had contention one another, being a Jewish people, they had contention one another of this situation. Okay? And maybe they're trying to feel out exactly what side he's on or if he's even on a side. Are you with us Pharisees or are you with them Sadducees? There's a lot of, you know, we, we can't get too deep into because we don't know. But we know what the scripture says here. Now, watch. Now, in the Old Testament, because we are a New Testament church, we know that there was priest, and in the New Testament, I'm not a priest, we're all priests. Everybody who saves a priest. You don't have to call no man on earth father, because you're able to come directly to God, you're a royal priesthood. You're able to come directly to God and pray. 
But in the Old Testament, they would come to the high priest. And the high priest was the number one man in the land. The priest, the minister. He was number one. He was over the king. Matter of fact, the king wasn't to do nothing until consulting with the priest. And that got Israel in a lot of trouble. And that started with King Saul when he went around the priest's office. It started with them very early in their history of a king. But the priest, the priest was not allowed to mess with this. Not the high priest, not the priest coming up behind. He was not allowed to to mess with this. So when it came to the priest of the land, in Leviticus chapter number 21, in verse number 7, I'll just, let me quote verse number 1 so you know the context here. In verse chapter 21 of the book of Leviticus, there is standard set for the priest. In verse number 21, and the Lord said unto Moses, speak unto the priest. And so we see it's directly, directly directed to the priest, the sons of Aaron, and say unto them, now watch, there shall none be defiled for the dead among the people. And he goes on with other things here. Okay, but I want to quote verse number seven. The priest, they shall not take a wife that is a whore or profane. Neither shall they take a wife put away from her husband, for he is holy unto his God. So the priest was not allowed to marry a divorced woman. The priest was not allowed to. And, and of course, in the, in the New Testament, we find the husband of one wife. This is why. This is not directly why, but this is the parallel. Let him be the husband of one wife. That's not dealing with polygamy. It's not dealing with that. Polygamy was, it's not dealing with having eight wives. But it's dealing with a position. So the high priest in the Old Testament was not allowed to marry a woman who had a bill of divorcement. He was not allowed. But if you weren't a high priest, and you, you were, you were. And, and it shows emphasis on some things here that God wants emphasis on in the sense of uh, leadership there with the priest. Now, Jesus gives the answer in verse 8. By the way, he, he is not telling us Moses was wrong. He has already told us that he came not to destroy but to fulfill Moses wrote five books. Verse number eight, he tells us why God gave that precept. Now, let me, let me give you two words that are very important. And they're very important in the Christian life, but they're important here. One word is called the perfect will of God. And the other word is called the permissive will of God, of God allowing. The perfect will of God is one man for one woman forever. But there is a permissive will of God. And Jesus is telling us now why God allowed this. Hardness of heart. That's it. That's it. Verse 8. Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And the beginning would go back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, where there is the example. There's only one man and one woman. That's the example. That's the beginning. That's the picture that Jesus is reflecting and referring back to. So we see here hardness of heart. What is hardness of heart? How easy can it happen? Why do we, are we told to even watch out for a hard heart? Are we told to beware of a hard heart? Better believe we are. We're told to be careful with our heart becoming hard. Uh, In a marriage, how can a heart become hard? Well, I'm not a marriage expert. But how can a heart become hard in a marriage? Differences. In what way? Sometimes, and this is not my business, But sometimes the difference is is financially. He wants to do this with money. She wants to do this with money. They headbutt with the money issue. He says, you get your own account. Do what you want to do. I'll get my account. I'll do what I want to do. That's an issue that has happened that is hardness of heart. Is it major? 
Well, I guess it can be, depending if it starts to swell up. Another one, and these are just things that are very legitimate that happen. Another one, he comes into the marriage, he's got three kids, she comes into the marriage, she's got three kids. Him and her are fine, but his second child and her third child hate each other. She tells mom all about it. He tells dad all about it. There's the other issue of a hardness of heart that starts to happen. Does it happen like that? I'm not saying it does happen. I just know in my thinking how this has got to take place because I know God doesn't lie. And then, you know, sometimes, well, you're not my dad. You're not going to tell me what to do. Now, me personally, I wouldn't want no kid telling me that. I'm just being honest with you. If I was remarried and a child I brought in under my roof that I was trying to help told me that, I would have a problem with that. That's just me. You're saying you got a little hardness of heart. I'm, I'm revealing it to you. I'm revealing it to you. Yes, I would. And by the way, if a mother, I don't think my wife would appreciate if, if she had to get remarried and a man came into her and with two kids and that boy said, you ain't my mom. Don't talk to me like my mom. You'll never be my mom. You ain't nothing like my mom. My mom was a lot better than you. What do you think about something like that? Does this happen? Sure it happens. Sure it happens. This is why... The, 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 the command was given. Is this what God wants? No. Is this God's perfect will to happen? No, 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 no. No. Do these things happen though? And being legitimate and honesty. Yes, they do. They happen. And so hardness of heart can happen financially. It can happen with kids. And then sometimes, let me just say this, and this is not easy to understand. There is what we call... The Bible teaches this, by the way. And I don't fully understand all this, but I know it's real. I know it's real. It's called the spirit of jealousy. The spirit of jealousy can come upon a woman, and the spirit of jealousy can come upon a man. And if the spirit of jealousy was to come upon them, there was a principle for that. Go see the high priest. He took up some dirt from the floor. He put it in holy water. He made them drink it. He wrote the order down. And according to the word of God, uh, pertaining unto the man hath the spirit of jealousy, and he thought she did this or she did that, they were to bring her in and she was to drink that water mixed with dirt. And if it happened in a period of time, her thighs would start swelling so much they would blow up. And, but if it didn't happen, then, there, then it's no, there's nothing here. And he would take water and blot out that situation. But I'm just saying hardness of heart can happen in many, many things. There's just... We're, we're all different, are we not? We're, we're, we're different. What may not be a trigger to you may be a trigger to me. And what may be a trigger to her may not be a trigger to her. In the sense of her thinking, well, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Well, I think it's a major deal. Um, another thing that leads to hardness of heart, finances, children, pre-existing children, having a problem, the husband going and talking about that with other people gossiping. The wife taking that problem and going to other ladies and talking about that. Boy, that'll create a hard heart in an individual. That will not help. That will not help. Matter of fact, I would encourage anybody that ever gets involved in that, you need to talk to the preacher and the preacher alone. I would not go tell nobody about this. Because if a husband hears about that going out, it's going to ruffle his feathers. And if she hears about this going out, it's going to ruffle her feathers. And it creates a hard heart. And, and let me say something about a hard heart. I'll give you a little illustration. Now, I don't run around outside like an Indian without shoes on. But I don't have no problem walking outside the yard in the mornings when it's warm out with my shoes off. But, you know, uh, some people, I guess the worst thing is they get calluses. Now, I, I probably ought not to say this, but I don't know. So my one son, he gets calluses. He works and, I, you know, he gets calluses. And we got this thing in the house. I'm a, I don't know. It's about that big around. You hold it in your hand. You turn it on. It's a sander. And so, you know, when it comes to, to heel treatment... <laughs> hit the back porch and sand it man and I don't am I weird here oh okay so I'm not real weird and so we sand that what do we sand it off that hardness that hardness if you get too close to it too fast what happens Ooh, ooh, that burns if we don't get it enough we don't accomplish what we set out to do this is a delicate situation this is a delicate situation. 
And this is where a pastor trying to help husbands and wives needs to be so diligent. Can't be two-sided, got to be so diligent and, and work through the things. Because as a pastor, you know what I know? The same thing other pastors know. None of us are perfect. And we have infirmities and we have problems. And there's a couple ways a pastor can get clipped right out of it and caught right out. Well, I tell you what, this is wrong. Got to get excommunicated. That's that. And he ain't got to counsel that. He ain't got to pray about that no more. He ain't got to deal with that or nothing. That's one way out. But I think another way is to try to work through it and try to say, well, if this thing isn't going to be what it ought to be, let's work through our differences. Let's get these differences together and let's make friends and let's still carry out a spirit the way we ought to. I mean, there's ways to look at this, which we're not done with this, but we are going to stop because of our time. Hardness of heart. Let's get back to this subject. Hardness of heart. Now, I think that the, the, the ointment is grace. And I think we all know that. I, I do think that grace softens the heart. But once again, being in certain situations, especially if they're repetitive. Man, I mean, the Bible says you're better off to move up on the corner of the household of a roof tend to stay with that stuff in their side they're brawling all the time. So when this is repetitive, over and 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 over, you get one layer of hardness, another 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 layer of hardness. And we just got to be aware of this because we are told, and just in a different illustration, this is what the children of Israel entering into the promised land. Paul says in Hebrews 3, 8, harden not your hearts. So I got to be careful about this just in my personal general life. I think this is something that applies as a pastor to sheep, sheep to a pastor, a husband to wife, parents to their children, children to their parents, church member to church member. Hardness of heart is so subtle and so sneaky, but so detrimental. Harden not your hearts. And this, of course, is in Hebrews, once again, chapter number three. And I'm, our time is gone, but hardness of heart or a hard heart. When we have a hard heart, listen to verse number eight, or excuse me, verse number eight, yes, yeah, says the principle, harden not your heart. Now listen to a couple things. This is what verse 10 says. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart. They have not known my ways. Now I'm going to say something about having a hard heart. You'll lose your way with God. You'll lose God's way. I'm, I'm just telling you how this goes. I don't believe it. I'm just telling you how this goes. You will lose your way with God. And, and you'll lose your way of, of focusing on God. And we've already talked about he made them male and female. We've already talked about that. So that starts to be lost. Okay? Now, in verse 12, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief departing from the living God. A hard heart will cause an individual to depart from God. And when you depart from God, me personally, I know this in my life. If I departed from God, I don't think I could be of much help to my wife. I don't think I could be much help. To, I don't really know that I could be of much help to anybody. I don't think I could. I think I could act like it, but I don't think I could. Verse number 13, but exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. A hard heart, a hard heart becomes hard through the deceitfulness of sin. Of what sin? I don't know. And getting back to, have you not read? See, this is a very personal thing. Don't know. Verse number 15 says, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice. Verse 16 says, for some, when they had heard, let me say this, a hard heart will do this to you. Not listening. You can talk all you want. I can't hear a thing, by the way. You can talk all you want. I see your mouth moving, I'm not listening, I'm not listening, I'm not listening. That kind of stuff plays out. Do you hear me? Da, 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 da. I'm not listening. That's an evil heart, that, a hard heart does that. And we want to be careful about a hard heart. And, and why all this? Well, verse number 19 sums this thought up. So we see that they could not enter in because of their unbelief. And that goes back to the word of God. You know. I want to use an illustration, but our time is up, and I can't. I can't. I want to use an illustration next week. I want to use an illustration 
of Jesus Christ when he was in the middle of that storm. And life has storms. In the middle of that storm, they came down and awoke him and they said, Master, carest thou not that we perished? And he stood up and rebuked the wind and they thought, what kind of man is this? And the Bible mentions that in the Gospel of Mark that they considered not the miracle of the loaves because they had a hard heart. In the storms of life, they definitely are able to be there. And we need the Lord to deal with these, and especially in the storms. Let's be dismissed. Uh, let me say this. I, I want you to think about two things here because we're gotta, i got to look at the rest of this. I do got to look at the rest of this. I want you to think about the permissive will of God, which is not his perfect will, but it's what he allows. It's his permissive will of God. But then there's the perfect will of God. The permissive will of God is seen throughout the word of God with Job. God gave Job, God gave Satan permission to do what he did with Job. That's, that's God's permissive will. But it was for a greater cause. God's permissive will is going to play out during the tribulation period when Satan is going to control the world. That's his permissive will. That's not his perfect will. His perfect will will come and destroy that and set up a thousand year millennial kingdom. The permissive and the perfect will of God are two different things, but yet they are clearly seen when we understand them. And we need to understand a little bit about that with this. Perfect will, perfect will. One man, one woman forever. Perfect will. Permissive will, we'll pick back up with this next week. The, by the way, the perfect will means complete. Permissive means allowing. Father, thank you for the 